Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our service of worship here at Glastonbury Methodist Church. And uh, a very special welcome to Patricia from, for actually making it, yay, over from Castle Carey. Um, and coming in, bless her, she was here before I'd opened up. So <laughs> taking no chances. So that, that's wonderful. Thank you. And we look forward to um, your message, Patricia. Um, thank you to our musicians, as always. Um, you'll see that Mary isn't here because her great-granddaughter is being christened this morning. So um, we're delighted for her. Um, we're especially pleased to see Pat back with us. So uh, lovely to have Peter and Pat again, yeah. Really nice to see you. Um, this morning is going to be uh, a session with your pens to sign cards. If people haven't done it, there's a card to sign for Tina for this afternoon's service. She's celebrating 30 years since she um, became a minister. So if you could please sign a card for Tina. We have one for Claire, who is at the start of her um, uh, becoming a local preacher. If you could sign that one over coffee, please. And, um, of course, it's Mary's 90th birthday um, on Tuesday. I'm sure she will get lots of cards from all of us, but this is one from us here at church. And um, the book of... Um, photographs and is is being passed round um thank you john this is one this is one for mary i'm sure lots of people have already signed it it's got Lots of photographs and her journey here from when she came 58 years ago, right up until this year, which is fantastic. So thank you to everybody who's provided photographs and to Angela and Mary, who, whose idea it was and who've put it together. They've done a wonderful job. Now we know we've got, we've got the template now, haven't we? <laughs> Um, I must just mention about um, Claire's service this afternoon at four o'clock, followed by tea. Everybody is welcome. And then um, next, next Saturday is the, our Jubilee celebrations here between two and four. Um, community singing, cream teas, um, things for the little ones to do. The church is going to be open between two and four. Um, hopefully it'll be nice and we can serve our ice creams outside and it's going to be a lovely, joyful occasion for everybody. So do spread the word. And now um, I've lit the peace candle. Should we just still our hearts as we come to worship? Dear Lord, may we feel your presence in all we do today, to be calm when we feel anxious, to be strong when we feel weak, to be gracious when tempted. And when the day is done, may we feel at peace in your presence. Amen. I'm really sorry, I've forgotten. A thank you from Mary. I won't read it out now because I've been going on, but it, she's very, very grateful thanks to everybody for last week. I'll leave it for you to read over coffee. Good morning, everyone. Am I near enough the mic? Hurrah. If you notice that your neighbour is doing this with their hearing aid, because I've moved away from the mic. <laughs> what 
or because I'm not speaking up. Put your hand up and something will be done. I'm not sure what, but something will be done about it. Yes, just make sure. I mean, you might actually wish to switch off, but that's a choice. So lovely to be back with you all. Thank you for having me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to be here today as part of our journey as children of the Sovereign Lord. Let us take this time to praise our God wholeheartedly and with joy. And we begin praising our Lord with all heaven declares. We join in with heaven declaring that our God is great. 293. And we come to God in prayer. Eternal God and Father, by whose power our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, with the whole company of your people in heaven and on earth, we rejoice and give thanks that he who was dead is alive again and lives forevermore that he is with us now and always, and that nothing can part us from your love in him, that he has opened the way to your kingdom and brought us the gift of eternal life. Lord God, may all glory, praise and thanksgiving, all worship, honour and love be yours for you are the almighty and everlasting God in time and for eternity. Amen. And now we confess to you, our Father in heaven, that our lives have fallen short of your standard of love in Jesus. We accept as of right your sacrificial love for us, and then deny our love to others. Not enough time to speak or care. We remember the hurts inflicted upon us and in petty revenge ignore the needs of others. We see our needs only 
and do not appreciate that we have riches to spare. Riches so great that there is enough for all. We recognise our selfishness and we are sorry. In sorrow, we ask your forgiveness. And we remember, Lord, you are a God of mercy, and we know that we are reconciled to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And we join together in the prayer that unites Christians, children of God, brothers and sisters of Christ, in time and in geography. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We come to that part of the service called the Word. So we're asking God now in our hymn to help us to learn from his Word. Number 501. We have two lessons this morning. The first one is the Gospel. Jesus praying, praying for us, praying for us in the future as well. And then we've got that very well-known story of Paul and Silas in a prison cell where their chains fall off. A really good favourite, I think, that one. So, thank you, readers. So the first lesson from John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be completely one, in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. Father, 
You have given them to me, and I want them to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me. For you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made you known to them, and I will continue to do so in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and so that I also may be in them. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. The reading from Acts is on, uh, from page 172 in the New Testament. Acts 16, starting at verse 16. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed along behind us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day, until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and spoke to the demon within her. I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted. They're teaching the people to do things that are against Roman customs. A mob quickly formed against Paul and silence, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so he took no chances but put them in the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. All the doors flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped, So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Don't do it, we're all here. Trembling with fear, the jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down before Paul and Silas. He brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with your entire household. Then they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. That same hour, the jailer washed their wounds and he and everyone in his household were immediately baptised. Then he brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Teach me my God and King, 668. Uh, Teach me my God and King in all things thee to see. Yes, in a prison cell, having been beaten, probably with a nasty bloody back. Teach me my God and King in all things thee to see, 668.
just recently, I became a very, very small part of the planning process for a funeral, and it was a privilege. It was so important to acknowledge and celebrate the life of the person themselves, for that person, and even more so, as it seems, for the family, friends and colleagues. And the service had to be just right. Good enough was never an option. Later, I discovered that there had been a slight hitch and a change of plan. However, in God's grace, I hadn't noticed, and the service was seamless and better than good enough. And then I think of journey planning, largely because of last year. Roadworks and a diversion. <laughs> well, that wasn't roadworks, that was a horrible cue. Or an accident, and what's worse, an unsignposted diversion. A puncture in the autumn due to a blackthorn cutting. Those thorns can really get through a thick tyre. But as I say, what happened last year? You will have your own experiences to add about diversions. I don't know about you, but I always think of Paul as a very planned person with the Holy Spirit hovering over him and directing him in tones that some sat -navs have, the first left. In fact, I find it hard to think of Paul as being ultra-flexible. He's always so definite, isn't he, in his writings? Um, like some sat -navs. Paul is in Philippi because he could not enter Bithynia or Asia generally. And if at this point you want to check up in your Bibles, it's the map on page 170. The Holy Spirit is redirecting him. And Paul is trying again and again to get into Asia. From various letters, we know that Paul relies on the Spirit for direction in what he does. But this time, it takes a vision at night to transfer his attentions from Bithynia and Asia over to Macedonia. And that's what they do. They travel over to Macedonia. So it looks to me as though whatever Paul's original plans had been, they've had to be put to one side. Possibly a bit frustrating. Did you have the story of Lydia last week? No, we didn't either. But you all know the story of Lydia and her companions turning to Jesus. They'd known about God, but this is Paul making sure they knew about Jesus as well. And, in human terms, it was a success. And it makes me wonder what Paul was expecting to happen in Philippi. A nice, straightforward run around the city. It didn't happen like that. We do not know what freedom that slave girl had in her wanderings around the town, the city, but she certainly managed to follow Paul and his companions, and the oppressing spirit within her kept crying out, hailing the evangelists as servants of the Most High God. And that was true. That is true. I think it's important to note that Paul did not act immediately. A few days went past. And as is typical of the New Testament writers who are recording activity, Luke gives us no information as to what Paul and the believers, and I'm including Lydia and her household, what they were doing during these few days. Um, I expect, I hope, I think, I'm certain that they put prayer at the top of their to-do list. But perhaps they were information gathering about the girl and her owners. Paul, Pat and the others checked up on local attitudes about supernatural spirits. Perhaps they had scenarios. 
Suppose we exorcise the girl, then what do we do with her? Do we leave the matter alone? Okay, if we exorcise her, perhaps Lydia or another female believer could take her into their home? Should the owners be paid? And if so, how much? By verse 18, Paul is reported as troubled, grieved, upset, or distressed. It depends on your translation. My translation that I brought with me has him troubled. The one that was used for today, he's exasperated. But other words in various translations are annoyed, irritated, and fed up. The whole episode is looking like a major incident on a motorway, taking up time that was supposed to be spent on preaching and teaching. What was the Holy Spirit thinking? What was this trouble for? Why wasn't there a make a U-turn now? In the end, Paul could do no other than relieve that poor young woman of her burden. We do not know what happened to her next. It, I don't know whether you've got passages where you want to take it up when you get, get upstairs, get, arrive in heaven. Now, what happened to? But as woke 21st century citizens, we may hope that the youngster was rehomed, possibly by one of Lydia's household, as possibly planned in the days leading up to that exorcism. And of course, Paul is rehomed with Silas into a prison cell. Every so often, Paul writes to Christians that following Jesus is a dangerous activity. And on one occasion, he tells the recipients of a letter just how many lashes of the whip he has received. But why should these be part of the route map for preaching and teaching? I mean, they're obstacles to the work, surely. Oh Lord, why do I have to be beaten up? Well, many of my children who do not yet own me are brutal. And you and my son are called to live among them to tell them a different story. Yes, it's a bit whimsical. But is this where we are called again and again to look for the positives? And we know what the positives are in this part of Paul and Silas's experience. A whole family comes to know the Lord God through Jesus Christ and because of the faithfulness of his servants, Paul and Silas. We can rejoice with Paul as we find that this diversion from the people planned route is so spectacularly wonderful. Well, who knows what the Lord has planned for each one of us. The politician Michael Heseltine had his future planned meticulously and the last entry on his sheet of paper was becoming Prime Minister. I don't know that he'd actually dated any of these uh, steps in his progress, but Prime Minister was there at the end. Did he become Prime Minister? No. Florence Nightingale's mother had planned a life of social success for her daughter. Florence was intelligent, well-educated, and she was attractive. Nope, that didn't happen either. And the last one with Thomas Bernardo, who knew he was called to China. And that's why he was doing the work he was doing until it was time to go. He wasn't ever seen in China. But we see his work today, as we do Florence's. I think that we're called to be flexible, having once said yes to the Lord. If I return to my roadworks and 
road traffic accidents and the like, we do see the need to slightly or wholly alter our journeys. And very occasionally, our destinations. Paul did not manage Bithynia, but he gained Macedonia. What we need to know is that God, through the Holy Spirit, is working on our route all the time. And if you like, when things are not quite just so, he recalculates and we have to trust him, like Paul and Silas. And now I want to return to that slave girl, perhaps include the man crippled from birth who begged at the gate beautiful, and others who were healed and did not appear necessarily to have family. This healing is a huge change in their lives. I wonder what it was like for that youngster or the man whose demons went into the Gadarene swine. I wonder what it was like for them to be alone in their own minds. I wonder what it was like for those blind people who had heard the voices and had got pictures of the faces and then they could see them. Those of us who've been radio listeners have got pictures in our heads for the voices. And then we see them on television and it's quite different. And possibly the same with our blind people. Today, in many parts of the world, including what we might call the developed world, there are people with physical disabilities, who are used as money makers, that is, beggars, by their families, or owners, people to whom they belong. And when the means of healing or some form of mending comes into contact with the person with difficulties, then the financial beneficiaries resist with all their might, or having lost one beggar, they go and find another. And unfortunately, it is entirely possible that the Philippian girl was sold by her family or snatched from another area altogether. And depending on your prayer notes, and what we see on television and hear on the radios and read in the newspapers, we know that it is happening today. Now, I hadn't intended this sermon to be one that concentrates on social justice, but I've been diverted for at least a paragraph. In this country, we occasionally find that some modern slavery gangs are, are discovered using people who, for instance, are cognitively impaired. And they have no protection from f friends or family. Indeed, some of them will have been sold by their families. And this is without going to places where sometimes injuries are inflicted on the victim to make them more pitiful and financially worthwhile. What do we do? Well, first of all, we need to be aware that it's happening, not just elsewhere, but here. We speak up. We make a noise about it. We advocate. We find out what it is that's going on, and we speak with knowledge. We might join an appropriate group. We persist. We pray. And the praying is something we can do every day. We have to take notice. Which does bring me back to today's reading and the first verse of that small portion from John. 
My prayer, says Jesus, is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. When I think of that girl in particular, I am relieved, thankful to realise that Jesus was praying for her decades after his resurrection from his place in the heavenlies. It does not relieve us of our responsibility to pray for others, whether or not we have a particular connection to that person. There is no way in which we can say, am I bothered? When we hear, see, read reports of disasters, natural or otherwise, equally we should be worried and concerned when we think of those, for instance, whose savings have disappeared due to recession or the fraudulent behaviour of others. You will want to name other circumstances where we should be bothered. Who is already quoting John Donne to themselves? No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as any manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Who is my neighbour? The slave girl and her modern day equivalents are my neighbours. I might meet them on my planned route or I might meet them on a diversion. It does not matter. I am called to love them in word and in deed. And I am called to bring them to Jesus and to pray for them. Amen. I've used the metaphor of a journey, um, which is why we're going to sing John Bunyan's famous pilgrim song. And I love the fact that singing the faith has got hobgoblins and foul fiends in. Some modern ones neglected to put those in, sanitised it. But no, hobgoblins and foul fiends. We do not know who we're going to meet or what we're going to meet on our journey. And yes, we will sing the appropriate hymn at the end.
And now we're very blessed to have Christine Ball leading our intercessions. Thank you, Christine. As we remember, Jesus returned to his Father on Ascension Day last Thursday. Our first prayer is on that thing. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we remember how you returned to your Father on the first Ascension Day. Although we cannot see you with our eyes, we know that you are still with us, as you promised always to be. We thank you for being our constant friend. Help us to remember that you are near and that you will never fail us. Help us to come to you when we are frightened or disappointed. And may we remember to tell you about our joys as well as our troubles. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, who after your resurrection from the dead did gloriously ascend into heaven, grant us the aid of your loving kindness that according to your promise, you may ever dwell with us on earth as we with you in heaven, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God for ever and ever. Amen. Today we'll obviously be remembering Ukraine, but I also saw that the Israeli Jews will be marching in the Muslim area of Jerusalem, of the old city of Jerusalem. And so may we pray for them as well for peace, a peaceful um, walk. Ascended Lord, King of the universe and nations, we lift up our hearts for all who, in our national affairs, are set us are bearing a load of responsibility. In my praying, help us to set aside our political views that with dispassionate sincerity we may pray for them as men and women. In all their ways, grant them sincerity and a desire to act in the highest interests of our dear land. And when the burden seems too heavy and weariness overtakes both body and mind, comfort and sustain them and those dear to them and restore them to serve you in all they do with clearer vision and heightened ideals that they may help to make our country the instrument of your will. We ask it in your holy name, Jesus, our risen, ascended, and glorified Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves. We need grace to follow Christ more closely. Grace to be forgiving towards our enemies. Grace to save us from self-pity when life's disappointments and sufferings come. Grace to think of the needs of others as well as our own. Save us from ever thinking that anyone is beyond the reach of your redeeming love. Sustain us, Lord, if the day grows dark and your face seems hidden from us and give us confidence to trust you through the darker hours. Whatever task you have given us in your world, help us to finish the work you have given. When each day is done, the last day completed, may we be able to trust ourselves and our affairs into your strong receiving hand. And in this last section, I will just have a short pause 
and whatever comes to your mind, the Lord will receive that thought. We bring to you the world you love and died to save. In our prayers together, we remember before you all who suffer. To the cruelty, injustice and violence of others. Those in prison because of their own wrongs or the wrongs of others. Those who are lonely and desolate because human love and loyalty have failed them. Those who are dying and all who watch with them and feel inadequate to help and support them. We commend to you all who seek to uphold the law and who strive for justice and human rights. All who care for the poor, the dispossessed, the outcasts of society. Those who work for the protection and well-being of community life, police, army, medical and social workers, teachers, counsellors and magistrates. All who bring the good news of the redemptive work of Good Friday and the immort immortal victory of Easter Day to be to a confused and lost world. Hasten, O Lord, the day of your triumph and the revelation of your glory. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray all these prayers in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers and answer. Amen. Thank you very much, Christine. Well, we've had the story of Paul and Silas's chains falling off. So we're going to sing 345. And can it be?
loving God, lead us out into the world, renewed in vigour, in hope, in faith and in purpose. Send us back to live and work for you, sharing your love and living your life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>